thank you for joining us for another episode of Praxis Perspectives and Business Insights. I'm your host, Matt Rossler, Director of Business Development. As a human capital management technology provider, Proxis has the good fortune to partner with many of the area's top professionals in employee benefits, human resources, and financial advising, as well as our area's top businesses and nonprofits. With a background in human resources management and consulting, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to spend time talking with these individuals to bring you impactful perspectives and business insights. Join us periodically as we spend a few minutes diving into different relevant topics. Over the past several weeks and months, our nation, cities, and towns have been hard hit by health, economic, and social crises, the compounding effect of which has left business leaders struggling to continue operations and support their employees across all of these areas. As we look to family, friends, colleagues, and other trusted advisors in our individual lives, business leaders must take stock of how they react as well. Communication is critical in challenging times, and my guests today are going to help us understand how and why leaders need to work to align core values as a move forward strategy. Scott Hackman is a business advisor and leadership coach who I've known for several years as a partner to Proxis and several of our clients. Scott owns and operates Scott Hackman Ventures, where he and his colleagues like Cynthia Moore Hollinshed, owner of Coaching for Clarity LLC, work with leaders to navigate change, build better practices, and develop a cycle of sustained growth. Scott and Cynthia, thank you both for uh, spending some time with me today, and tell our listeners, tell our listeners excuse me, a little bit more about you and your work. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, again, I'm Cynthia Moore Hollinshed, owner of Coaching for Clarity LLC. Um, I have 26 years in coaching and education, and in various roles, always as part of my job was leadership coaching and coaching coaching for issues of diversity equity and inclusion so in october of 2019 i decided that that is all i wanted to do and not the other stuff that came with the various roles that i was responsible for so i took a leap of faith and launched my own company and since then i have worked with um, school systems, nonprofits, and corporate companies around uh, leadership development and also, again, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you so much for having me. Very good. Happy to have you, Cynthia. How about you, Scott? Yeah, I'm Scott Hackman, and I'm the founder of Scott Hackman Ventures, and we guide leaders through growth and change. I have uh, 20 years of leadership in organization and business, and for the last um, 10 years have been focused on the leadership development side. Um, have my own practice since 2018, where I primarily work with business owners and their leaders and their teams uh, to develop their capabilities and their capacities to, to grow during change. Very good. So, you know, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're going to focus today on values and how they impact business decisions. So Scott, when you say values, are you talking individual values that a business leader may hold or more corporate values that are defined for a business? Um, I guess, or are, are those kind of one in the same? Uh, Cynthia and I actually had this discussion and we could uh, have it right now that we both see them as important to be aligned. So the individual values of a leader and the corporate values they serve as a leader uh, the more they're aligned, the more there is a synergy and and less likely there is the, the embedded conflict that can happen during the needs for change and transition. Um, some of the things that get in the way of leaders' abilities to change is when their personal values are in conflict uh, with their overall organization or corporate uh, needs and goals and what would be some of the the kind of outside influencing factors that would cause that misalignment right so when you say that you've got individual um goal or excuse me values as a leader but there could be misalignment between corporate goals where where else is that input coming from to establish those corporate type of goals well it depends on the size of the organization um as far as how many inputs but a leader like taking the current situation we're coming out of and also still in as a result to the crises you've mentioned, there's a lot of input. There's input from uh, politically or government 
whether it's national or state on changes in policies related to employment workforce there's change that there's there's needs or demands placed on organizations based on owners or shareholders depending on the size of the organization um, and then there's the the values and the needs that are based on the the employees and the team members that the leader serves so during crisis it's it's a it's ultimately a challenge but it's also this opportunity to assess and evaluate as a leader with their stakeholders be it their owners their employees or other you know what 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 of these values are are we relying on are we are effective in our decision making are helping to guide us and potentially the opportunity also is what what here isn't working that and that what value is not no longer serving us or sticking and allowing us to to get through this yeah and i know we'll talk in a, in a couple of minutes here about what that what that process of you know reflection needs to look like but before we get there um, cynthia i'm curious from you first and then scott you as well give us an idea of the types of values that you each hold for your own businesses um, so I would just echo what Scott said about the importance of personal and professional vision or values being aligned with each other. Um, a strong indicator of good values is that they allow you to live into them in a way that your intentions, words, thoughts, and behaviors and beliefs all align. And when you don't have the cognitive dissonance of trying to decide whether or not you're going to live into your personal or your professional values, it makes the work much easier. And so with that said, uh, core values for my organization, organization and my work is authenticity, always being asset based, building on people's strengths, and then care and love. Very nice, Scott. Yeah, so our core values are compassion. We show self compassion so that we can hold space for learning to take place. Well being, we cultivate joy, loving kindness, courage, and faith. Diversity, we facilitate different perspectives in learning and development so people of any race and gender identity feel welcome and meaningful work. We guide individuals and organizations to deliver meaningful work excellence in leadership and teams. Very nice. And I think, you know, from what both of you just mentioned, they're all, uh, all important values to hold, certainly, uh, certainly during these, these most recent couple of months. Uh, so, Cynthia, I know you work with organizations to conduct sort of a, a self-audit of decision-making during crisis. Uh, tell us why that reflection is, is so important and so necessary. Absolutely. I think some people erroneously believe that we just learn from our experiences. And what uh, our work has taught us is that we don't simply learn from experience. We learn from active intentional reflection on our experiences. And so with with COVID and going to virtual work and distance learning and all of those adjustments, that has never rang true as much uh, now as it has before. So um, one of the, the process that we go through is that we give employees, organizations, and teams an opportunity to really vet out what it is they think they've lost as a result of the new normal. And so we have an intentional step in the process where they list out what those losses are and then codify or categorize those losses into good or bad. Because another learning that we've had is particularly lately through this crisis is that everything we lost wasn't a bad loss. Some of the things in our new normal actually turned out to be more advantageous than some of the behaviors we were manifesting or demonstrating before that. So that's the first step in the process. The second step is to really vet out those losses, good or bad, and determine the actual lessons that we've learned from those losses and articulate that in a way that we can leverage that learning into a desired outcome or an you know particular action steps so that is what i mean by an intentional reflection on our experiences that lead us to action and learning out of a crisis great scott anything you want to add there well 
Yes, actually. So Cynthia and I worked together on a project where we've done this together. And one of the findings um, is, one of the assumptions is that this has to be like top down. And I think in this example, what we find is leaders at any level that can go through this active reflection, um, they can codify for themselves their learning and they can bring that to their manager, to their teams. And it's so important now more than ever that there's communication going up, down and across about what we're learning uh, in the workplace reflectively and actively. And I was just wondering, uh, Cynthia, if you would say a little bit more about what you observe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What I observed is an opportunity to do this with a core group of leaders who are looking to advance in their roles. Um, it's like Scott talked about. Um, this didn't necessarily come top down as it was more of a personal reflection that was transferable to others in the group as well as the organization as a whole. So what this process led to is what I call a sort of conscious competence. There are some people who do things intuitively very well, but they haven't taken the time to name what those things are because they haven't taken the time to actively reflect. And so when I did this with a core group of leaders, what we determined is that they had a set of skills that most of them named as new learning as a result of their new working conditions with COVID that they weren't aware of, they weren't sure that their peers were aware of, and most importantly to them at least, um, that their managers were aware of. So after going through the process that I just described in my previous answer, we decided what from their learning that they wanted to illuminate to those in the team and the organization and what they wanted to improve. So that's not really rocket science. People do that all the time. But again, what was profound about this is um, the, the level of informed articulation around what I need to illuminate and what I need to improve. And a lot of them reported back that their managers validated their self-awareness around what their strengths in learning was, were and also what they should work on as an improvement. And a lot of the managers also asked them about this process so that they could do it for themselves and potentially facilitate it for a larger team. So again, um, just the outcome of really developing conscious competence so they can articulate it and transfer it in different contexts. And, and Matt, what, what we're finding as a value that may be not just in this organization, but others that are doing this values alignment work during or after a crisis is that learning becomes a value. So right. a, a great framework for that comes from Carol Dweck and her work on the growth mindset, which simply states it's the effort you're putting forth in your job, in your leadership, that is your, your mastery. It's the effort, not the perfection. It's what's the effort you're putting towards it. It's learning from mistakes. So it's the willingness to say, hey, I'm not good at everything. I'm not strong at everything. So I, I'm going to learn from what mistakes did I make and be open to receiving information from other people that might be and will be ultimately challenging so that when that information comes back, the, the person's ready and doesn't feel so much threat to themselves. Because we know under crisis, it feels very threatening. We, there's the out external changes that are happening that are causing workplace changes and leadership decisions that need to be made sometimes on a daily basis. In fact, the example I was going to share was related to an executive team um, with several thousand employee base that had to make rapid decisions about, um, you know, things like furlough, things like keeping, keeping the production going. And what they were able to do as they did this active reflection is look back on a, they were very successful in comparison to other companies in their industry at staying the course during this crisis and coming out, you know, relatively strong considering. And they were able to secondly come out of it and secondly reevaluate what is it really that makes a leader successful here and a manager successful here that we have overlooked. 
So what is the, the value that we, we maybe assume that everyone would get it, that, hey, a leader here, they, they're going to show up physically when there's a crisis. They're going to stay engaged and no task is going to be too small for them. They'll get their hands dirty. Maybe they were a professional in a, you know, a certain office space, but they're getting more involved on the line or they're walking around and seeing what problems they can help solve. And that, and so that codified for them what characteristics, which is part of their values now in leadership, they could really write down and bring into their whole talent system. So their talent acquisition, talent management, and development advancement system. So these these crises, when leaders and teams take the opportunity to reflect, give opportunities to, like Cynthia is saying, to let go of stuff to illuminate strengths or learnings and growth, and also to codify, hey, going forward, this is what we need more of. Let's go find it, let's develop it, and let's keep it. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really, really important part, right? Because you can, you can go through a, a process like this and you can write some stuff down on a piece of paper and then you know, it gets put in a drawer and, and nothing really comes of it. But uh, you kind of preempted a question of mine, which was going to be, talk to us about some of the actionable outcomes. And you know, like you said, the, the talent management, ta uh, performance management, talent acquisition, leadership development. I mean, that's where once you've taken stock of, you know, of your values and of the characteristics that make somebody successful with an organization, that's where all that stuff really comes into play, right? right. Um, and, you know, I like what you said with the, the learning really becomes a value because if we can start, you know, learning and educating our employees around these values, around these characteristics and build them into our, you know, our, our everyday collective experience at an organization, that's when it really starts to take hold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even even something it may sound basic, but even in an interview process or asking for examples of when was a time there was there was threat during work or you felt like your job was at stake. You know, what did you do as a result of some external disaster or external crisis? Or you could even bring up the most recent one. What did you do? How did you respond? How did your team respond? How did your organization respond? And you can really start to glean insights on, hey, does this person have the kind of values, have they expressed those kind of values related to what we are looking for? Do they have a growth mindset? Are they willing to learn from mistakes? Are they willing to put forth the effort? Um, so that's some of the talent acquisition actionable steps. You can, you can build it into your interviews and then making explicit in the, in the development you know, these are ways leaders responded during this most recent crisis. Here are the examples. So this is what we're looking for going forward. And I would just add to that, that we see better results in terms of implementation, particularly with adult learners, when there is this element of self-diagnosis instead of mm. its external evaluation. And so just by virtue of diagnosing my own strengths and things that I need to improve, adult learners typically have more ownership and are more likely to implement than they are if somebody is telling them all the things that are wrong with them and all the things that they should do better. <laughs> so. so if we take a step back, and I'll throw this one out there, you both can, can chime in. Taking a step back, looking at the process itself, you know, with the exception of, of maybe putting it all into play, but the, the reflection itself, how long does a process like that take? And, you know, is this something where, where you would recommend or where, frankly, it's, it's necessary to have kind of a, a leadership retreat where we, you know, we go away for a day or we go away for two days to really, you know, shut our laptops, shut down the, the outlook and, and focus on, on this, um, you know, this necessary kind of task at hand. Mm -hmm. I, Cynthia, do you want to go? Uh, you feel free to go first, Scott. Uh, I'll wait. Well, what I'm learning is that, no, I, I think that's too long. That's waiting too long, A, to do it, because to get an offsite takes a lot of effort. Uh, it takes a lot of coordination and time. I would, you know, most companies, and if they don't, please do start, I challenge you to start postmortems using these reflective questions about what you've learned, what you've lost, and what you will do next. Use them now, you know, don't wait. 
and build it into a cadence, like build it into whether it's your leadership meeting or your management meeting or your one-to-ones. You can build the questions into a cadence. Start, so you could add 30 minutes, add an hour and a half to a management meeting and say, in this point, we're gonna do a postmortem based on the crisis. We're gonna bring in our values as our basis for what worked, what didn't, what we learned and what we're gonna do going forward. And we're really gonna look at, you know, how do we cascade that into the other parts of our management system? Um, most companies we work with have moved, moved towards and a way of overly formalizing their, they moved away from overly formalizing their performance management and they've moved towards one-to-ones. So how can you take those questions as a leadership team out into your one-to-ones and into your team meetings and then come back in a week, two weeks, a month, no later than that, and say, here's what we found. So what do we do next from this information? Mm -hmm. um, I would echo 100% what Scott just said. So I'll just really briefly add that uh, the initial process with the group probably just takes 45 minutes or so with a group, but where the specificity is really important is in those one-to-ones where we can really drill down into the person's action steps. Again, making sure that they're aligned to the, the values that they've articulated and that they are given measurable goals and they have a clear picture of what their action steps will look like. And in terms of the cadence that Scott talked about, and particularly in our one-on-ones, we often spend time having planning conversations and problem solving conversations where we don't protect, it's time for reflecting. And so embedding in those one-to-ones a place for all three of those things to happen. What are we planning? What are we problem solving? And what reflecting do we need to do based on what we've already experienced and learned? You guys, I got to tell you, you're doing a great job of preempting all my questions here because one of them was going to be, you know, how often should leaders and organizations undertake an exercise like this? And, you know, I'm getting the sense that it's really a, it's a continuous process, right? There's once you start it, keep it going. Don't let it be overly formalized, like you said, Scott, or else it's going to start to feel forced and people are going to start, you know, just trudging through it to get it done. But if you, you know, if you make it a little bit more informal but make it part of the the overall business strategy and, and process um, then that seems to, to kind of make a little bit more more sense mm -hmm. yeah and it and it shifts it, it makes a more agile organization because it shifts the focus from we're going to solve a problem and it will never come up again or we're going to get it right and then we'll never have to review it. it's saying no everything yeah. it, Change is constant. Now more than ever, there are things impacting our business and our lives that are way outside of our control. So what can we do? We can learn, we can adapt, we can make plans, take actions and learn from them. And so when, when we adapt, adopt and accept a learning mindset, this stress, really, we are all under, this pressure we are all under, be, can become a motivator, can be a motivator to now work together and not be scared, basically, because we're going to be bringing this information forward. Got it. So real quick, both of you, you know, we're, we're getting to the end here, but uh, any particular success stories that you want to quickly share, uh, you know, where the process has really had some significant impact on a client of yours? Well, the one I, the example I gave, um, the executive team, they're very grateful that they took the time to not just assess what worked from a business financial standpoint, but from an organizational people standpoint, so they can integrate that into going forward because talent is a real, is a real issue. And there's a real opportunity right now for organizations that know really what they values wise values wise what they want in their talent because there's a lot of talent out there so as organizations come back to work now these organizations the one i named and there's a couple there's two others that i haven't talked about but are now looking more specifically related to that and finding ways to build that into their acquisition process 
-hmm. And so I would also uh, just piggyback on that and circle back to the example that I gave previously. And I think the value add that I heard most often articulated by folks who went through this process is that um, the realization that there's a real difference between what we know and what we are learning. And so being able to tease that out as an individual and then as a team really gave some insight into what's ne what is next. So just the difference between what we know, what we're learning, and what's next. Perfect. And I just want to make sure here before I wrap up, so the kind of the three questions that we want to be asking ourselves is what we've learned, what we've lost, and what we're going to be doing differently moving forward. Do I have that right? You do. And since I'm a former English teacher, I get all excited <laughs> about alliteration. So I think about them as losses, lessons, and leverage. So what do, there we, you go. What do we learn and how do we leverage these lessons for future action? Losses, lessons, and leverage. I like that. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, Scott and Cynthia, listen, I want to thank you both for your time today. I, you know, I really appreciate you sharing your insights into this area of effective leadership. Uh, certainly today more than ever, taking a moment to, to really stop and think and evaluate our decisions is, is more and more crucial. Uh, so while it's not an easy time you know, of uh, frenetic change here, refocusing around our core values will help business leaders stay true to themselves and to their mission. Um, so anything else before I, I let the two of you go? Um, I would just add in a final word that the facilitation of this process is as important as the content of the process. So mm. I will just, um, I won't elaborate on that. I'll just leave that as my final thought. <laughs> Agreed. Ditto, which is, which is largely a lot of what Cynthia and I do is the facilitation and coaching. So please sure. re reach out to Cynthia. Um, and we are deeply grateful to be thought partners with you Pro at Praxis and appreciate this opportunity. Thank you yep. both and to so that point, much. Yeah, and to that point, I mean, we, we do have your contact information up here on the slide. So if anybody that's uh, listening is interested in reaching out and kind of going through this process, um, by all means, feel free to reach out to either Cynthia or Scott. Um, and likewise, we're, you know, we're appreciative of the, the relationship that we've built over the last couple of years and uh, look forward to, to continuing that moving forward. Great. Thank you both. All right. Thank you.